in the last lecture we talked about the antibiotics that either inhibit the cell wall biosynthesis or disrupt the cytoplasmic membrane. So, today we will continue our discussion on the antibiotics and in this lecture we will focus on the antibiotics which inhibit the nucleic acid biosynthesis or protein biosynthesis or metabolic pathways. Let us start with the antibiotics that target the nucleic acid biosynthesis. But before we jump into this aspect, let me make you familiar with two important concepts. One is DNA supercoiling and the other one is topoisomerases. As you know that DNA has two helical strands that are wrapped around each other. So, let us say this is the axis about which the two strands are wrapped around each other. Now, this is called coiling. You can think of telephone cord as an example of this coiling. But in case of replication and transcription process, these two strands must be separated. And during that process, it can induce strain in the DNA, which can lead to over twisting or underwounding. And this is called as supercoiling, which literally means the coiling of a coil. Now, you can think of this supercoiling in this way. Let us say if we are going to bend this axis or twist this axis, this will lead to supercoiling. Let me make you familiar with this supercoiling concept by another term called as linking number. So, linking number is the number of times that one strand passes over the other. So, linking number is the sum of twist plus right. Twist is the number of helical turns whereas, right is the number of super helical turns. You can perhaps think twist as passing over of strands within the helix itself whereas, right as passing over strands when one helix crosses over the other. For example, here that twist is 1. Therefore, a linking number is also 1 because it does not have any right. There is no super helical turn here. The same thing goes here in this case as well. So, here the twist is 1, then 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, then 6. So, here the linking number is 6 because there are 6 number of twist, but there is no right here. This is the example of relaxed DNA. What happens if the linking number is changed? If the linking number of DNA is greater than the linking number of relaxed state of DNA, then it is called positively supercoiled. And if the linking number of the DNA is less than the linking number of the relaxed DNA, then it is called negatively supercoiled. In other terms, you can think of negatively supercoiled DNA as removing of the twist and introducing the right in the opposite direction. Now, you may ask what is the importance of this DNA supercoiling? So, this helps the DNA to get packaged in a very organized manner. Here, the DNA wraps around this histone proteins which forms this nucleosomes which are further coiled and supercoiled to give chromatin which is then condensed to give this chromosomes which are involved in the cell division process. Therefore, supercoiling is very essential. Now, let me explain you this in another way. Let us say DNA is in a form of a circle. Now, the two new circles are wrapped around each other. No way they are going to go to the daughter cells during the process of replication because there is a mathematical theorem saying that if the two circles are wrapped around each other, they cannot be separated unless you cut them because mathematically it is impossible to separate the two strands. right? So, what does the cell do? Cell cuts it because even cells cannot violate the theorem. This is the job that is carried out by this enzyme called as topoisomerase. Let us say I have a DNA in which the both these strands are wrapped around each other and another DNA in which both these strands are separated from each other. Are they chemically different? No, they are chemically same, but they are topologically different. In one case, they are topologically entangled with each other. In another case, they are topologically separated. So, they are called as topoisomers. And it turns out there is an enzyme that does this job and they are called as topoisomerases. There are two kinds of topoisomerases. One is type 1 topoisomerases which cuts only one strand and type 2 topoisomerases which cuts both the strands. So, this topoisomerase cuts one or both the strands, grabs the two end, passes over the other side and joins it. Right? So, this process of cut and paste, cut and paste is continued until both the strands are disentangled from each other. As we are mostly focused on the bacteria, let us see what kind of topoisomerase bacteria have. It turns out the bacteria has type 2 topoisomerases which can be further classified into DNA gyrase and topoisomerase 4. Now, DNA gyrase introduces negative supercoiling whereas, topoisomerase 4 relaxes both negative as well as positive supercoiling. And these enzymes are the targets for the antibiotics such as quinolones and fluoroquinolones. So, here these quinolones and fluoroquinolones are broad spectrum antibiotics. Again, they are bactericidal in nature because they are going to inhibit this DNA gyrase and topoisomerase 4 which 
uh, inhibits the replication of bacteria and that is how the bacteria is going to kill. These fluoroquinolones can be further classified into different generations. For example, the first generation fluoroquinolones are highly effective against gram negative organisms such as nalidixic acid and inoxacin. As the generation of the fluoroquinolones progresses, they become more and more effective against gram positive organisms as well. For example, in case of four generation cephalosporin like trovafloxacin, it is effective against gram negative as well as gram positive organisms. But unfortunately, this drug has been withdrawn from the market because of its severe hepatotoxicity. These are some of the structures of the fluoroquinolones and if you see all of them have a common core structure which is a quinolone moiety. There is a carboxylic acid that is present at the third position, there is a, a fluorine that is present at the eighth position and a piperazine moiety or any amine based substituent at the seventh position and all these substituents are essential for inhibiting this DNA gyrus and topoiosmolase 4. Now let us have a quick look how this fluoroquinolones inhibit this DNA gyrus or topoiosmolase 4 enzyme. So once the DNA is prepared for the replication process, this DNA gyrus enzyme comes into picture or topoisomerase 4 comes into picture and forms a complex called as DNA gyrus complex. Now this is attacked by these quinolones or fluoroquinolones and that leads to a formation of this ternary complex. Now here in case of this ternary complex, because of the quinolone scaffold, it can have a proper stacking interactions with the DNA and because of this carboxylic acid, it is involved in a chelation with metal called as magnesium present in the active site of this DNA gyrase enzyme or topoisomerase 4 enzyme. And the substituents at 6th and 7th position is also involved in having a proper interaction with the enzyme and that is how they are going to inhibit this either DNA gyrase or topoisomerase 4. Because of the inhibition of these enzymes, the bacteria are unable to replicate and that leads to killing of the bacteria. Again, um, as I already mentioned you, as the generation of fluoroquinolones progresses, they became more and more effective against gram positive organisms as well. For example, here the first generation cephalosporins are highly effective against gram negative organisms, but when you move from first generation to fourth generation, they are effective against gram positive as well as gram negative organisms, even they are effective against anaerobic microorganisms too. These fluoroquinolones are mostly prescribed for urinary tract infections, respiratory tract infections, endocarditis, and meningitis. But these fluoroquinolones are associated with major side effects such as tendonitis which is associated with the inflammation of tendons and it is also associated with neurotoxicity that can damage your nervous system. Fluoroquinolones are also associated with nephrotoxicity which leads to a damage of the small subunits that are present inside a kidney called as nephrons. Fluoroquinolones are also associated with a serious cardiotoxic effect which leads to QT interval prolongation. And this can lead to a pathological condition called as torsa de pointers. That can lead to pathological condition called as torsa de pointers. So, before going into the specifics of how the antibiotics inhibit protein synthesis, let us briefly review how the ribosomes are involved in this process. Bacterial genes are translated into proteins by RNA. The type of RNA that carries the genetic information from the DNA is called mRNA or messenger RNA and a protein synthesizing machine to which the message is carried to is called ribosomes. Bacteria have 70s ribosomes whereas eukaryotes like humans have 80s ribosomes. Let us take a closer look at the bacterial 70s ribosome. It is composed of two subunits, one smaller 30s subunit and a larger 50s subunit. The smaller 30s subunit is the one in which mRNA feeds and the larger 50s subunit carries out the catalytic function. Yes, I know 30 plus 50 is equal to 80, not 70, but this is not a math mistake. Here, the S stands for Swedberg unit. Using the Swedberg unit to measure ribosomes means that things do not always add up perfectly because the rates of sedimentation are not additive like the molecular weights are. So, the protein synthesis in bacteria can be divided into three stages. The first stage is called initiation phase. The second phase is called as the elongation phase and the third phase is called termination phase. Initiation of the protein synthesis begins with the binding of formyl methionine tRNA to the start codon that is present in the mRNA already bound to 30s subunit. This is followed by recruitment of 50s subunit which then leads to formation of a complex called 70s. The ribosomes translates the mRNA into proteins by reading the nucleotide triplets known as codons which specify amino acid that are required to make up for specific proteins. The transfer RNA or tRNA for short brings the individual amino acid to the amino acyl site. 
that is also called as A site, which then forms a peptide bond with the growing polypeptide chain present in the peptidyl site, also called as P site. So, here you can see that tRNA brings an amino acid called valin, which then forms a peptide bond with the peptide that is already present in a P site. So, here it forms a peptide bond with the tryptophan and this is how the peptide bond is being formed. Then the empty tRNA is being released from the ribosome and the ribosome moves from one codon to the next codon, thereby transferring the tRNA with the growing polypeptide chain from A site to P site. And this process is continued until the ribosome encounters a stop codon such as UAA, UAG and UGA that signals the end for protein synthesis. So now you may have guessed that antibiotic act at a specific site on the ribosome and inhibit the protein synthesis. So the antibiotics that inhibit the protein synthesis can be categorized into two classes. One is 30S subunit inhibitors that include tetracyclines and aminoglycosides. And the second one is 50S subunit inhibitors which include chloramphenicol, macrolides, lincosamides and oxazolidinones. This lecture will focus on a detailed discussion on each of these class of antibiotics. Let us start with tetracyclines. Tetracyclines are broad spectrum antibiotics which are obtained from streptomyces species and they exhibit bacteriostatic effect. So these tetracyclines are widely prescribed form of antibiotic after penicillins. Generally they are highly effective against aerobic gram positive as well as gram negative organisms but have very limited activity against anaerobes. Tetracyclines are also effective against a bacterium called as Borrelia burgdorferi, a bacterium that is a causative agent for Lyme disease that is characterized by fever, rash, flu-like symptoms and joint pain, etc. Tetracyclines are also good against Chlamydia trachomatis, a causative agent for a sexually transmitted disease called as Chlamydia. They are also good against Mycoplasma pneumonia, which is a causative agent for atypical pneumonia that is characterized by lower respiratory tract infections. Tetracyclines are also good against Brucella and Rickettsia genus of bacterium. Let us have a look at the structure of tetracyclines. Tetracycline contains a nucleus that is derived from octahydron tetracine which consists of four annulated six member rings. Due to the presence of four rings, they are called as tetracyclines. Here the rings are labeled as A, B, C and D. The way it is numbered is from here, from 1 to 12. All the tetracyclines have a very similar structure. Here the carbon atoms 4, 4A, 5, 5A, 6 and 12A are potentially chiral depending on the substitution. Just by a little change in the substituents at different positions in the basic structure of ring, we can get different compounds. For example, tetracycline has a hydrogen atom at 7th position. Just by a mere substituting this hydrogen by an electron withdrawing group like chlorine gives chlorotetracycline and dimeclocycline. Likewise, substituting this hydrogen by an electron donating group like dimethylamino functional group gives minocycline. Oxytetracycline has a hydroxyl group at 6th position which is absent in case of doxycycline. Now these tetracyclines can be classified based on a source it is obtained from. For example, natural tetracyclines include tetracycline and oxytetracycline whereas methacycline and minocycline are semi-synthetically derived tetracyclines. Tetracyclines are also classified based on the duration of action meaning how long they are going to reside in our body, what is their plasma half-life. So this classification is merely on the basis of pharmacokinetic parameters. So based on the duration of action, tetracyclines can be classified into three classes, short acting tetracyclines, intermediate acting tetracyclines and long acting tetracyclines. Short acting tetracyclines include antibiotics such as tetracycline and oxytetracycline with an average plasma half life of 6 to 8 hours. Dimeclocycline is an intermediate acting tetracycline with an average plasma half life of 12 to 16 hours. Likewise, doxycycline and minocycline are long acting tetracyclines with an average plasma half life of 16 to 24 hours. The tetracyclines and oxytetracyclines have a very short half life, therefore they are administered every 4 or 6 times to a patient. Since long acting tetracyclines are well absorbed with a higher plasma half life with an average from 18 to 24 hours, they can be administered twice a day. Here is a clinical example, tetracycline is given at a dosage frequency of 250 to 500 mg every 6 hours daily to a patient. whereas Minocycline is given at a dosage frequency of 100 mg twice a day because it has a longer half life than the corresponding tetracycline. Let us delve into the chemistry of tetracyclines a bit more. Tetracyclines are amphoteric compounds meaning they can form salt with either an acid or a base and they have three acidity constants which are responsible for protonation in aqueous solutions. 
So this is first PK, this is a PK at 2 and this PK at 3. Here the conjugated ketone all system at C1 to C3 is acidic with an average PK of 3. The dimethyl amino functional group at C4 position is basic with an average PK of 9. Likewise, the conjugated phenolic enone system at C10 to C12 is neutral with an average PK of 7. Another interesting property of these tetracyclines is that they undergo epimerization. So this epimerization occurs in a solutions of intermediate pH. So here the tetracyclines are converted into inactive isomers called as epitetracyclines and these epimers exist in equilibrium. The important fact is this epitetracyclines have very less activity when compared to tetracyclines. To be precise, epimers have only 1.5% activity of the tetracyclines. Due to these reasons, tetracyclines need to be freshly prepared and used in order to gain desired maximum activity. Let us have a look at this SCR of tetracyclines. So it, the characteristic structural feature for a tetracycline is annulated four six member rings and each ring needs to be carbocyclic meaning you cannot introduce any heteroatom in this ring otherwise it will lead to loss of activity. The conjugated ketoenol tautomerism at C1 to C3 is essential. The carboxamide functionality at C2 position is also essential. Replacement of this carboxamide functionality by any other functional group such as aldehyde or nitrile will abolish activity. The dimethyl amino functional group at C4 position is also essential. Removal of dimethyl amino group reduces the activity. The hydrogen and hydroxyl group at C4A and C12A in alpha and beta orientation is also prerequisite for the antibacterial activity of tetracyclines. The conjugated keto in all system at C10 to C12 is also essential. Likewise, the D ring needs to be aromatic. There is an influence of substituents that are present at the seventh position in this D ring. Here, electron donating groups like dimethyl amino functional group in case of minocycline enhances the activity. Likewise, electron withdrawing groups like chlorine also enhances the activity as observed in case of chlorotetracycline. Therefore, chlorotetracycline and minocycline are more potent tetracycline antibiotics than unsubstituted tetracyclines. Aromatization at ring C will also lead to inactivity of this class of antibiotics. There is an influence of substituent at the sixth position. Let me explain you this property by taking an example that compares between oxytetracycline and doxycycline. Oxytetracycline has a hydroxyl group that is present at the sixth position which is absent in case of doxycycline. This doxycycline can also be called as 6-deoxytetracycline. 6-deoxytetracyclines possess important chemical and pharmacokinetic advantages over their corresponding 6-oxy counterparts. Removal of hydroxyl group at the sixth position dramatically changes the solubility profile of the tetracyclines and this effect is uh, significantly seen in terms of octanol water partition coefficient. Oxytetracycline has a hydroxyl group at the sixth position because of that it is more hydrophilic and it has a lower octanol water partition coefficient whereas doxycycline is lipophilic which is observed in terms of higher octanol water partition coefficient which is around 0.95. Due to this lipophilic character for doxycycline, they are well absorbed, they exhibit high plasma protein binding, they have a higher volume of distribution and they have lower rate of elimination resulting in a longer half-life of this class of antibiotics. Therefore, doxycycline has a longer half-life and it is a long acting tetracycline than corresponding 6-oxy tetracycline. So tetracyclines enter into the bacteria through porins by active transport or by facilitated diffusion. Once they enter, they bind to the A site of the 30S ribosomal subunit and inhibits the binding of amino acyl tRNA to the A site. This prevents the addition of new amino acid to the forming peptide chain and this results in the inhibition of elongation phase of the protein synthesis. So to remember you, the protein synthesis is divided into initiation phase and elongation phase. Tetracycline inhibits the elongation phase of protein synthesis, not the initiation phase. As you are familiar that all drugs are associated with one or other side effect, tetracyclines also have some side effects such as photosensitivity, gastrointestinal disturbances and hepatotoxicity that refers to damage to our liver cells. Tetracyclines have a strong affinity for calcium and can accumulate in developing tooth and bones leading to discoloration of tooth and inhibition of bone growth. As a result, there is a deficiency of calcium called as hypocalcemia. Tetracyclines are also associated with a rare side effect or called as Fanconi syndrome that is associated with the dysfunction of proximal tubules of the kidney. 
So this syndrome is characterized by symptoms such as vomiting, proteinuria and glycosuria. Proteinuria is a condition which is characterized by excess amount of protein in urine. Likewise, glycosuria is a condition which is characterized by abnormal amount of sugars in urine. Thankfully, this syndrome is reversible meaning that these effects will fade with time once the administration of tetracycline is stopped. Another class of antibiotic that inhibits the protein synthesis is called as chloramphenicol. So, this is also a broad spectrum antibiotic and this was first isolated in 1947 from the soil sample collected in Venezuela from Streptomyces venezuelae. It exhibits bacteriostatic effect at a lower concentration and bactericidal effect at higher concentration mostly against Haemophilus influenzae which is a bacterium that is responsible for influenza that is characterized by lower respiratory tract infections. So, chloramphenicol is also effective against aerobic and anaerobic both gram positive and gram negative organisms such as Bacillus anthracis, Haemophilus influenzae, Salmonella species. Chloramphenicol is also effective against a bacterium called as Neisseria meningitidis which is a causative agent for meningitis which is characterized by inflammation of meninges that cover the brain and spinal cord. It is also effective against rickettsial infections which are characterized by fever, rash, flu-like symptoms, etc. Chloramphenicol is also good against tetracycline resistant cholera which is caused by Vibrio cholera which is associated with symptoms of severe watery diarrhea leading to dehydration and to the death of the patient if not treated at the appropriate time. This is how the chloramphenicol structure looks like. It possesses two chiral centers. A chiral center is the one to which four different functional groups are present. It seems obvious that here these are the two chiral centers and by applying the formula of 2 to the power of n where n is the number of chiral centers there are four stereoisomers possible for this chloramphenicol molecule. Here these are the four stereoisomers. Let us assign the R and S stereochemistry for this molecule. Priority to the stereo center is assigned by highest priority going to be the atom that is located on the top of the periodic table or to the atom with a heavier atomic number. So, in this case oxygen has a higher atomic number so it will get first priority and the least priority will go to the hydrogen atom. Now you have to choose between carbon atoms one to which nitrobenzene group is attached and to the other carbon to which nitrogen, carbon and hydrogen is attached because nitrogen dominates over carbon. So, this will get second priority and this will get third priority and if you show the arrow it is in clockwise direction. So, therefore, it has R stereochemistry. Likewise, in this case the nitrogen dominates over other atoms. So, this will get first priority and the least priority will go to this hydrogen atom and then you have to choose between two carbons. So, here the carbon is attached to two hydrogens and one hydroxyl group and here it is attached to one hydrogen, one hydroxyl group and nitrobenzene group. Therefore, this gets dominated over this and here if you see it is in anti-clockwise direction. So, therefore, it has a as stereochemistry. So, overall the stereochemistry for this stereoisomer is 1R and 2S. Now, these stereoisomers can be further differentiated into erythro and threoisomers. Erythroisomer is the one in which two identical substituents are present on the same side. Here the substituent is hydrogen. The two hydrogen atoms are present on the same side whereas, in case of threoisomer they are present on the opposite sides and if you look closer these are mirror images of each other. Therefore, among these four stereoisomers there are two pairs of enantiomers. Now, the presence of stereocenter in a molecule can lead to differences in the pharmacological activity. To differentiate the enantiomers in terms of pharmacological activity we use two terms called as utomo and a distomo. Utomo is a chiral enantiomer that has desired biological activity whereas, biologically inert or inactive isomers are called as distomo. So, among these four stereoisomers the d erythro is the utomo that means this is the only isomer which is responsible for its antibacterial activity whereas, the other isomers are inactive. Like any other antibiotic chloramphenicol enters into the bacteria by passive diffusion or facilitated diffusion and bind at the A site of the 50s ribosomal subunit and blocks the peptidyl transferase center that catalyzes peptide bond formation. This prevents the transfer of elongated peptide chain to the newly attached amino acid tRNA which generally results in bacteriostatic effect. When it comes to side effects, chloramphenicol is associated with dose and non-dose related bone marrow depression such as aplastic anemia. This is a rare and sometimes fatal condition which is associated with deficiency of red blood cells. 
deficiency of white blood cells and platelets. As a result, this condition is called as pancytopenia. Here, the suffix penia always means deficiency. So, here in this case, there is a deficiency of red blood cells, which is called as erythrocytopenia, as well as deficiency of white blood cells called as neutropenia. The deficiency of platelets is called as thrombocytopenia. And the combination of the deficiency of these three cells is called as pancytopenia. And the serious side effect associated with Tonafenicolis gray baby syndrome, which generally results in the inability of an infant's immature liver to metabolize chloramphenicol. This generally develops in babies and children when chloramphenicol is given to their mother during labor or at some point during pregnancy. And this is mostly associated with side effects such as vomiting, diarrhea, hypotension, CNS collapse and even death of the baby. Fortunately, this effect is not observed in adults because our liver has enzyme called as gluc uronidase that converts the chloramphenicol into chloramphenicol glucuronide, which is a very hydrophilic and polar conjugate and it can be easily excreted in the urine. In rare cases, it is possible to have a serious allergic reactions to chloramphenicol as well. Due to these side effects, chloramphenicol is rarely used nowadays and is mostly preserved for the severe life-threatening infections for which other antibiotics are not available. Next, another class of protein synthesis inhibitor is aminoglycosides. These are broad spectrum bactericidal antibiotics which are usually isolated from streptomyces species. Aminoglycosides include antibiotics such as streptomycin obtained from streptomyces griseus. Another antibiotic is called canamycin which is obtained from streptomyces canamyceticus and streptomyces fradiae which is a source for another aminoglycoside antibiotic called as neomycin. They are generally used to treat infections caused by gram negative bacteria. That is not to say they do not cover for gram positives, but usually we have better options for those infections. They are generally used to treat wide range of infections such as tuberculosis, tularemia, plague, subacute bacterial endocarditis, hospital acquired pneumonia, urinary tract infections and so on. But their use can come with a price. Before going into the chemistry aspect of aminoglycosides, let me remind you what the term glycoside stands for. Glycosides are compounds that contain sugar moiety called as glycon and a non-sugar moiety called as aglycon. And these moieties are linked by a glycosidic linkage and that is why it is called as glycoside. Aminoglycoside refers to the compounds that contain sugar moiety called as glycon which is glycosidically linked to aminocyclitol which is a aglycon moiety here. Aminocyclitol is a basic pharmacophore present in the aminoglycosides and these are some of the examples that belongs to this aminocyclitol family. So, aminocyclitol mostly contains 1,3 diaminofunctional group in the cyclohexane ring which is decorated with many hydroxyl groups here. Streptomine is one such example which contains 1,3 diaminocyclohexane ring with hydroxyl group at 2nd, 4th, 5th and 6th position respectively. If you remove hydroxyl group from the 2nd position of the streptomine, it gives you 2 deoxystreptamine. Streptidine ring has a guanidine moiety at 1 and 3rd position respectively instead of aminofunctional groups. These aminoglycosides can be classified based on the identity of aminocyclotol ring. Majority of aminoglycosides contains 2 deoxystreptamine as a central pharmacophoric ring in aminoglycoside. Based on the substitution pattern in the ring, they can be further classified into 4 monosubstituted aminoglycosides, 4 5 disubstituted aminoglycosides, and 4 6 disubstituted aminoglycosides. Here, the S1 corresponds to the amino sugar that is linked at position number 4, whereas S2 corresponds to the sugar that is present at the 5th position or 6th position respectively. Neamine is one such example that belongs to the family of 4 monosubstituted 2 deoxystreptamine aminoglycosides, whereas neomycin is an example of 4 5 disubstituted aminoglycosides. The most commonly used aminoglycosides such as canamycin and gentamicin belongs to the family of 4 6 disubstituted 2 deoxystreptamine aminoglycosides. But there is another class of aminoglycosides which lacks this 2 deoxystreptamine ring. Instead, they contain a streptidine ring. One such example is streptomycin. Here is the structure of streptomycin which contains a streptidine ring that is glycosidically linked to another ring called as L-streptose, which is again glycosidically linked to another uh, sugar called as N-methyl L-glucosamine. Together, the ring B and the ring C is called as streptobiosamine. On hydrolysis of streptomycin, it gives you two components. One is streptobiosamine and the other one is streptidine. This streptobiosamine undergoes further hydrolysis to give N-methyl L-glucosamine and L-streptose. Aminoglycosides enter into bacteria through active transport or by facilitated diffusion and bind at the A site of the 30S ribosomal subunit and it prevents the polysome formation. 
Further, it is also responsible for disaggregation of polysomes into non-functional monosomes leading to misreading of mRNA which results in a miscoded peptide chain elongation and thus it inhibits the protein synthesis at the initiation phase. This results in the inhibition of many metabolic pathways that results in leakage of cellular constants from the bacteria and cell death of the bacterium. To remind you, aminoglycoside is the first class of antibiotic which inhibits the initiation phase of the protein synthesis. The toxicities of aminoglycosides include nephrotoxicity and autotoxicity. Remember that price I mentioned earlier? Well, there it is. Aminoglycosides tend to concentrate in the little subunits called as nephrons present inside the kidneys resulting in aminoglycoside induced nephrotoxicity. However, this condition is reversible meaning we can usually undo any kidney damage by altering the dose of aminoglycosides or by providing hydration therapy such as uh, pumping of water, vitamins, minerals and nutrients into the bloodstream using an IV. Aminoglycosides also have a tendency to concentrate inside the 8th cranial nerve resulting in aminoglycoside induced autotoxicity. Unfortunately, this condition is irreversible. It can consist of vestibular and cochlear damage leading to symptoms of hearing loss. Thus, aminoglycosides can cause irreversible hearing loss. Aminoglycosides are also associated with a long-term neuromuscular disease called as myasthenia gravis. And the next class of protein synthesis inhibitor is macrolides. Macrolides are among the widely prescribed form of antibiotic. These are narrow spectrum antibiotics and are usually isolated from actinomycetes species. They exhibit bacteriostatic effect. They are predominantly used to treat infections that are caused by gram positive bacteria and they are active against a limited range of gram negative bacteria such as streptococcus, staphylococcus, helicobacter pylori and haemophilus influenzae. Macrolides are mostly prescribed for respiratory tract infections such as atypical pneumonia and whooping cough. They are also effective against Clostridium diphtheria which is responsible for diphtheria which is a condition that is associated with severe nose and throat infection. They are also good against conjunctivitis which is associated with inflammation of the conjunctiva of the eye. Some of the popularly prescribed macrolides include erythromycin, clarithromycin, telithromycin, cetromycin and azithromycin. The chemical structure of macrolides contains a large macrocyclic lactone ring with 14 to 16 atoms and this lactone ring is substituted with many alkyl and hydroxyl groups and a ketone functional group at a 9 position. This is one such example called as erythromycin. The macrocyclic lactone ring present in erythromycin is called erythronolide. It is also substituted with sugars at the third and fifth position respectively by a glycosidic linkage. The sugar that is present in the third position is called cladinose. Whereas the amino sugar that is present at the fifth position is called desosamine. And the such example of this macrolide is clarithromycin. There is a very minor structural difference between erythromycin and clarithromycin. Erythromycin has an alkyl group at the second position which is absent in case of clarithromycin. Here the macrolides also enter into the bacteria by active transport or by facilitated diffusion and they bind at the P site of the 50S ribosomal subunit which prevents the transfer of peptidyl tRNA from A site to P site and this inhibits the movement of ribosome along mRNA to the next codon due to inhibition of translocation of the nascent peptide chain and thus it inhibits the elongation phase of protein synthesis. When it comes to side effects, macrolides are associated with very common side effects such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, ringing or buzzing into the ears. Less common but serious side effects include QT interval prolongation. QT interval is a part of electrocardiogram that provides information about the heart and cardiac conditions of a patient. Generally, it is measured in terms of milliseconds. So, in case of men, the QT interval is 350 to 440 milliseconds. In women, it is around 460 milliseconds. So, if this QT interval is greater than 500 milliseconds, it can lead to conditions called as ventricular arrhythmia and torsa depointus. And the serious side effect associated only with the use of erythromycin is cholestatic hepatitis which is associated uh, with the condition of inflammation of liver due to which bile cannot flow from liver to the duodenum. Lingosamides are another class of protein synthesis inhibitor and these are narrow spectrum antibiotics which exhibit bacteriostatic effect at lower concentration and bactericidal effect at higher concentration. The thing is they are active only against gram positive bacteria and they are very negligible activity against gram negative organisms. Lingomycin is a prototypical antimicrobial agent of this class that is obtained from streptomyces lincolensis. 
The lincosomates also work like macrolides. They bind at the P site of the 50S ribosomal subunit and inhibits the protein synthesis. Generally, they are preferred as an alternative antibiotics to the patients who are allergic to penicillin. They are also used as topical agents for the treatment of acne and they are also capable of killing the malarial parasite. Clindamycin is a semi-synthetic derivative of lincomycin that contains a pyrinosmoity and a pyrolidine ring which are linked by an amide bond. The pyrinosmoity present in this clindamycin is called methyl thiolincosamide. The pyrrolidine moiety present here is an unusual amino acid called as propyl hygric acid. Another class of protein synthesis inhibitor is the oxazolidinone class of antibiotics. This oxazolidinone class of antibiotics are a relatively recent addition to the antimicrobial world and have been found very useful in treating infections caused by gram positive bacteria. They show excellent activity against methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, Streptococcus, and Enterococcus, all of which have shown alarming rates of antibacterial resistance in clinical settings. They show modest activity against gram negative as well as mycobacteria. Linozolid and torazolid are some of the antibiotics that belongs to this family. They have a unique mode of action. Their mechanism is more or less similar to aminoglycosides. Here, they bind to the 50S ribosomal subunit and prevents the formation of 70S ribosomal complex. And as a result, it inhibits the initiation phase of the protein synthesis. This oxazolidinone class of antibiotics are used for many infections which are resistant to many clinically used antibiotics such as methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus caused endocarditis. They are also useful in community acquired pneumonia. This is the basic pharmacophore of oxazolidinone and this is the structure of linozolid which contains a four substituted phenyl ring in the third position of the oxazolidinone pharmacophore. To summarize, antibiotic act at a specific site on the ribosome and inhibits the protein synthesis. Some of antibiotics act at the initiation phase of the protein synthesis, some act at the elongation phase of the protein synthesis. Aminoglycosides and oxazolidinones inhibit the initiation phase of protein synthesis. Here aminoglycosides bind to 30S and inhibit the formation of 70S complex. Likewise, oxazolidinones like linozolid bind to 50S and prevents the formation of 70S complex. Whereas other antibiotics like chloramphenicol, macrolides, lincosamides and tetracyclines bind to either 30S or 50S subunit respectively and inhibit the protein synthesis. Now, let us move to another class of antibiotics that target the metabolite pathways. When you hear the word metabolism, you might think of skinny and not so skinny people and how people say things like he has a super fast metabolism that is why he can eat whatever he wants but still look that good. So what is metabolism anyway? Metabolism is all of the chemical reactions that occur inside an organism to sustain its life. Bacteria have metabolisms too. That is how they convert the nutrients that they take from the environment into all of the useful molecules they need for their day to day lives. So here we are going to talk two such antibiotics which inhibit the metabolite pathways. One is sulfonamides and the second class of drug is called trimethoprim. As these drugs inhibit the metabolite pathways, they are also called as antimetabolites. Let us start with sulfonamides. Sulfonamides are a broad spectrum synthetic antibacterial agents that have a common sulfonamide chemical group. They exhibit bacteriostatic effect at lower concentration and bactericidal effect at higher concentration. Generally, these sulfonamides are given in combination with another folate biosynthetic inhibitor called as trimethoprim, which we are going to discuss in detail in the next coming part of the lecture. So, these sulfonamides are classified based on the onset of action and based on the duration of action. For example, there are some sulfonamides which can reach in higher concentration in the urine and therefore they are mostly used for bladder infections such as renal sulfonamides. There is another class called as gut acting sulfonamides which are mostly used for gastrointestinal infections. There is another class called topical sulfonamides such as silver sulfadiazine which is mostly used for burns and infections. Again, these sulfonamides can also be classified based on the duration of action. That means how long they are going to reside in the body and what is their half-life. Sulfathiazole is a short-acting sulfonamide. Sulfamethoxazole is an intermediate-acting sulfonamide, whereas sulfamethazine is a long-acting sulfonamide. Sulfonamides are used to treat bladder infections as they reach in higher concentration in the urine. They are also effective against nocardiosis, which is an uh, infection caused by nocardia bacteria. They are also effective against drug resistant malaria. So, in such cases, sulfonamides are given in combination with another anti malarial drug called as pyrimethamine to treat drug resistant malaria. 
they are also good against many bacterial infections when they are given in combination with another folate biosynthetic inhibitor called as trimethoprim. So, the combination of trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole which is one of the widely prescribed sulfonamide is called as cotrimoxazole. So, therefore, sulfonamides are not given alone, they are always given in combination with another folate biosynthetic pathway inhibitor called as trimethoprim. So, sulfonamides inhibit the pathway which bacteria use to synthesize tetrahydrofolate which is a metabolically active form of folic acid. Folic acid is a vitamin that is needed in order to synthesize nucleotides and amino acids. Basically, without folic acid, cells would not be able to synthesize DNA, RNA or proteins. Therefore, it is a pretty important metabolite. So, here GTP nucleotide is a common precursor for the synthesis of 7,8-dihydroterene pyrophosphate. Then 7,8-dihydroterene is assembled from dihydroterene pyrophosphate and paraaminobenzoic acid which is abbreviated as PABA for short in the presence of an enzyme called dihydroteroide synthase. Then this dihydroteroide is enzymatically glutamylated to form 7,8-dihydrofolate which is further reduced in the presence of dihydrofolate reactase to give tetrahydrofolate which is an important precursor for the synthesis of purines, pyrimidines and proteins. And this is how the structure of tetrahydrofolate looks like. It has a pteridine ring and a paraaminobenzoic acid and a glutamic acid moiety. So, now you may have guessed that sulfonamides and trimethoprim inhibits these two key essential enzymes that are involved in the folate biosynthetic pathway. Sulfonamides inhibit the dihydroteroid synthase whereas trimethoprim inhibit the dihydrofolate reactor enzyme. Sulfonamides are competitive inhibitors for this enzyme meaning they compete with the real substrate of this enzyme which here is PABA or paraaminobenzoic acid. If you look at the structure of paraaminobenzoic acid and sulfonamide, they look a lot alike to us and to the enzyme. Therefore, the enzyme is fooled into accepting the sulfonamide molecule into its active site. Thereby, it prevents the binding of paraaminobenzoic acid to the enzyme and thus it inhibits the synthesis of tetrahydrofolate by inhibiting this dihydroteroid synthesis enzyme. Likewise, trimethoprim is a potent competitive selective inhibitor for dihydrofolate reactase enzyme which inhibits the conversion of dihydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate. In short, these two drugs have a synergistic effect when they are given in combination. So, combination of sulfonamide and trimethoprim introduces sequential blocks in the biosynthetic pathway of folate metabolism and thereby the combination is much more effective than either agent alone. So, the combination of sulfonamide and trimethoprim is called as cotrimoxazole. The sulfonamide which is given in this combination is sulfamethoxazole. When it comes to side effects, it is mostly associated with very less common side effects such as gastrointestinal disturbances, crystalluria, hematuria, hepatotoxicity, etc. It is also associated with hypersensitivity that can range from allergy or rash or hives to anaphylaxis and even Steven Johnson syndrome. It is a very rare syndrome that affects the skin and mucous membrane. In a nutshell, we have covered on various classes of antibiotics few antibiotics target the cell wall biosynthesis, some are going to inhibit either nucleic acid biosynthesis or protein biosynthesis and some are going to target the metabolic pathways. Please remember that each antibiotic is always associated with some or other side effect and other thing is overuse or misuse of any of these antibiotic can lead to development of resistance against that respective antibiotic by the bacteria. Therefore, the sound knowledge of antibiotic is essential in order to treat the appropriate infection for a given individual at a given time. Thank you so much.